45th President of the United States, and the 47th is on his way here right now. Well, I'm John Comerford. And I'm Jennifer Bremen. And we come to you from NRA's Institute for Legislative Action, and we'll be your guides through the day. Jen, who's up first in this program? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a real treat for you tonight. We have the dynamic country duo of the War Hippies, otherwise known as Scooter Brown and Donnie Reese. Both Scooter and Donnie, they have a fan club, are U.S. combat veterans. When they're not making fantastic music, they're supporting military members and their families through fundraising and advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm NRA welcome to the War Hippies. What's going on, Pennsylvania? Man, y'all are awesome. I was telling him side stage, I was like, that's just wild, man. Well, we're gonna play a few songs here. This land is mean This dirt is red from the blood it's seen Raised on the good book, hand on a gun Never backing down the American sun I'd like to introduce 
my part over here on the violin, Donnie Reese, served in Iraq in 2004 with the United States Army. And I'm a United States Marine Corps combat veteran, served in Iraq in 2003. And now we're a couple long-haired songwriting musicians traveling the world doing something that we love and we found a peace in our lives that we don't ever want to let go of, man. We just want people to be cool with one another, be kind to one another. It ain't too hard to ask, right? But there's a thing about being cool and kind and loving one another. And there's another thing that if you come and try to take it, and if you come and try to take it, we will still stick an ax in your face. So let me tell you where we come from. Now we come from the farms and the ranches. The old field hands are ones who turn to riches. We built these bridges and roads. Yeah, the big rig drivers hauling a load. We're the mason, the cop, the coal miner. The banker, the lawyer, and the firefighter. I'm the man in the shadows who carries a gun. I'm a sheepdog, the American. American son. song we don't do very many cover songs but when we do it's because uh, we want to pay homage we want to pay homage to a man that was a mentor and a friend and this goes out to Charlie Daniels and all of us long haired country boys
God bless Charlie Daniels. Well, man was an amazing patriot, and I guarantee you if he was still alive today, he'd be up here on this stage. It's the very first single we put out. It's a little bit of a life behind the scenes in the music video. Says we're on our way. Ride up to Rolling Stone, six months since we've been home. Traded in the van, the bus has got us rolling on. Everybody says, Yeah, we're killing it. When the curtain falls, and there ain't no miss call. Empty, and I should be feeling ten feet tall. A shooting star that's killing it. But I ain't feeling nothing at all. Ain't got a whiskey problem. I've got a mess you problem. We should be dancing at the top, but I hit the bottom of the spot instead of just a little bit. much we got one more song for you once again we are the war hippies and i will tell you up front in our industry in the entertainment industry being a couple combat vets standing up here on an nra stage for a guy named president trump 
It's not really well received in our business. Donnie and I are independents. We do our own thing our way. And we honestly don't give a shit what they think. And we love to have y'all support. Coming here on out, if you guys look us up, War Hippies, we appreciate you guys very much. Uh, thank you, NRA, for having us. And uh, God bless the man that's going to walk up on this stage. And uh, hopefully we see amazing things turn around for this country. This last song is a little story that, uh, that Donnie and I wrote together based on a conversation I had with a, a fellow by the name of Kurt Russell. I was sitting around a campfire or his place uh, outside of Aspen, Colorado, and uh, I really loved his, uh, his character called John Ruth the Hangman in a movie called The Hateful Eight. And uh, so I said, well, man, I want to write a song about it. And so we did, and uh, Kurt loved it, and uh, we had to record it, and uh, this is uh, how it goes right here. You've been running with the devil and it ain't no lie Living in the shadows of the pale moonlight but You've been running with the angels everyone could see
champions, y'all. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate y'all. How incredible are these guys? Give it up for the war hippies. If you think that was impressive, what you're going to hear next is truly moving. Please stand for the playing of our national anthem by Donnie Reese on the violin. Let's hear it for the war hippies one more time. All right, so I have the distinct honor of introducing you to the gentleman who's gonna lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Tom Yeager. Lieutenant Colonel Yeager served for 23 years and flew over 324 combat missions over Iraq and Afghanistan. Lieutenant Colonel Yeager is a real-life maverick serving as an instructor at the Top Gun Flight School. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Yeager. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, everyone, our next speaker. It's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you the Interim Executive Vice President and CEO of the National Rifle Association, Andrew Arulanandam. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this is my first major public speaking engagement. Thank you. And I have to speak before a fired up crowd like you, before the NRA president, and before President Donald J. Trump takes the stage. That's a pretty hard assignment, but could be worse. They could have made me speak after the president. 
And that's why I'm going to be very brief. And I would be making a very serious mistake if I didn't take this opportunity to thank all of you. About 12 years ago, this community stood on principle. And they, in standing on principle, this community helped save this great show and this great community. The Harrisburg com economy was in peril when the then organizers of the show bowed down to political pressure and abandoned it. The NRA stepped in, began negotiations, and two years later, the Great American Outdoor Show was born. Thanks to all of you. Today, not only does Harrisburg host the largest outdoor show in the world, it hosts the best. <laughs> Local government, and this includes the one year where we didn't have a show, estimates that we've pumped in together more than $700 million into the local economy. And let me tell you one thing, the NRA is not going to stop until we hit a billion and then some. Over the past seven days, the halls of the farm show complex have been filled with outdoorsmen from all walks of life and from all over the country, indeed all over the world. Just regular folks like us who cherish our outdoor heritage and support the principles that this great country was founded upon. And today, you and I know that those values are under attack in Washington, in state houses across America, in courts, and of course in the media. So for me, it is a privilege and an honor to work with the men and women of the National Rifle Association who every day valiantly step up to the plate to safeguard this great American freedom. Thank you to all of you. And our thanks to you does not stop over there because it is because of people like you, the NRA members in Pennsylvania, you helped elect President Trump nearly eight years ago. I'm gonna apologize for this because I want, I want to look at my notes so I don't miss anything. As President, Donald Trump expanded hunting opportunities. He supported efforts to open millions of acres of federal land to public access and reversing bans. You know, remember the silly bans on uh, traditional ammunition? He reversed that. He, that's a great point. He helped prevent federal infringements on state wildlife management practices. It was President Trump who repealed executive orders put in place by the Obama administration that would have banned booing is right. That would have that would have banned firearm possession for millions of law-abiding Social Security recipients. And we will never forget this. On NRA stage at our annual meeting in 2019, President Trump withdrew the United States from the UN Global Gun Control Scheme. that ensured 
that our Second Amendment rights would never be subject to the whims of some international bureaucrat. I'm closing, don't worry. 2024 will be a decisive year in our fight to protect our rights. It will be up to all of us to ensure that we have the leaders who support freedom, leaders like your fellow NRA member, President Donald J. Trump. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you. Let's hear it one more time for NRA CEO Andrew Rolandum. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for another treat. It is my pleasure to introduce to you my colleague and NRA spokesman, Billy McLaughlin. Billy? And I'll say we're never going to give up our guns. So I wanted to welcome all of you to the NRA Great American Outdoor Show. This is real America. If you look to your left and look to your right, look behind you and in front of you, you will see NRA members, you will see patriots, you will see constitutionalists, and you will see everything that makes America great. But if you could take a moment and look at the middle of the arena, that's the mainstream media. <laughs> All right, it's kind of... <laughs> It's kind of unclear if they like you, media. But, so we have CNN here. We have MSNBC. We have the New York Times. Exactly. And can I say, you guys are a badass crowd. You guys make the job easy. So gun-hating politicians and their promoters in the anti-gun media hate everything we stand for. They hate how we choose to defend ourselves, our families, and our loved ones, and they hate everything that makes America great. But most importantly, they hate those 27 words that we fight for every day, the Second Amendment. a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Say it with me. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed. Not be infringed. Louder so the media hears it. <laughs> And many of them are live on TV right now. I could see their lights. So at this moment, let's make sure that their audience hears us. USA. 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 Louder. USA. We have to go louder, guys. Make them hear it. Oh, 
awesome. <laughs> Guys, but the fact is every year, over one million law-abiding men and women like you and me, patriots, law-abiding citizens, use firearms to defend themselves, their families, and their communities. And the anti-gun media refuses to cover it. In fact, this same anti-gun media refused to cover NRA member Raul Mendez. Watch his video. I'd rather look like this than be lying dead next to my family. This right here is the only reason we're alive. No one ever told my story, and we all know why. My name is Raul, and on July 3rd this year, we were celebrating our freedom at a friend's house when the unthinkable happened. A neighbor we never met came in uninvited and started shooting at all of us right out of the blue. Before I can actually comprehend what was happening, one of our dear friends was shot and died instantly. Next thing you know, the shooter shot me right in the side of the head and through my left eye. I hit the ground unconscious. Everyone in the house was screaming bloody murder and thought I was dead, including my family who sprinted to a nearby bedroom and tried barricading themselves. What felt like an eternity passed, and then my eyes opened by God's grace to the sound of the shrieking screams of my wife, two daughters, and friends who knew I carried a concealed pistol. After a short struggle against two brave friends, the shooter broke away from the fight and started to reach for his second gun with my family lined up as his next victims. But I put four shots in his chest and sent him straight to hell. If I didn't have my gun, everyone in the house would have died. The news vans would have been front and center, but because I did, you never even heard about it. In fact, each year, over one million law-abiding Americans use firearms to protect themselves and their loved ones. But in 2021, America's five largest newspapers published just 10 news stories reporting defensive firearm use. In contrast, those same newspapers had a total of 1,743 news stories containing the key words murder, gunfire, or shot. We still have no idea why that man opened fire that day but it has only reinforced our family support for the Second Amendment. I was in the hospital for five days, and when I finally got out, I bought my family two handguns to train with. Evil will always exist, and we are more ready to confront it with equal force now more than ever. This family will never be victims again. My name is Raul Mendez, and I am a proud lifetime member of the National Rifle Association of America. So Raul Mendez, NRA member just like you guys, he embodies everything that makes NRA great. One year after this horrific event where he defended his family, he became an NRA instructor and now he's training other people around the country to defend themselves and their loved ones. So next, let me introduce one of our closest friends at NRA. Her name is NRA instructor Robin Evans. Robin Evans has trained 4,500 women, victims of rape, domestic violence, stalking, and violent crime. Watch her video. We have been stalked, we have been raped, we have been beaten, we have been kidnapped, but we will never be victims again. Let's work. Welcome to Chicks with Triggers. I am Robin, your instructor for today. What Chicks with Triggers is, is a safe space. This is a safe space for women. I have trained over 4,500 people. We're about uplifting women. We are about encouraging women. We're about empowering women. There was no safe space where women could go and talk to other women who have been in similar situations. I was involved in a, um, in a domestic violence relationship, and I actually had a gun pulled out on me during that relationship. He started following me everywhere I went. He started putting stuff on my car. Moms um, that are single are very vulnerable. We are preyed upon. They're always gonna be able to have access or get their hands on a gun. It's either gonna be you or them. 
and at the end of the day, you want to be standing there alive. How would you feel if it was your wife, your daughter, your mother getting stalked, abused? Would you want them to be script the guns? Ban the assault weapons now! Every single person that's talking about taking away our guns, they plan on keeping theirs. You control your outcome. We are faster than 911. I am my first responder. Because of Robin, I have been more comfortable in handling and shooting the gun and also learning the gun laws. Any threat that comes our way now, I feel like with my gun, I can handle it. If I needed it, I feel more comfortable pulling it. I am a mother of a five-year-old daughter and we will never be victims. Yes, it's cool if you have it in your car. Yes, it's cool if you have it in your holster on you, but do you know how to actually use it? I think the more prepared you are, then you can kick some ass. Now I know you're going down. Like every single time there's a, there's a video out about black women learning guns or Asian women learning guns or Latino women learning Guns. It's always saying, well, why does that matter? It matters because we weren't here before. This was a demographic that wasn't here before. The NRA is single-handedly the biggest and strongest organization, especially for gun rights in this country. And I think without them, we would be absolutely screwed. For anyone trying to take away our Second Amendment right, I say, come and take it. Give it up for Robert Evans. So on October 7th in Israel, terrorists from Hamas went and killed, slaughtered, beheaded 1,200 babies, men, women, and children. And what happened here in America? Crazed leftists took to the streets and anti-Semitism increased drastically. We have an NRA instructor, his name is Rabbi Yossi Eilfort. He took action and he jumped into action and protected his community and trained them. Watch his video. The nation is seeing an increase in anti-Semitic attacks. I feel like a target. Explosives have been thrown at the synagogue right behind my house. Unbelievable, the fact that these people can be on the side of terrorists. You are kidding! Oh, Last year, we had about 950 calls for service. Since October 7th, we're over 1,200 calls. So Muganam's mission is to train and empower the community to deter and respond to security threats. We're trying to give everybody the tool to be empowered to protect themselves. God forbid uh, something happens, i be ready for it. I've put on about seven of these lectures in the last three weeks with over 700 people attending in total. My 21-year-old daughter, she was harassed on social media, telling her they're going to come to the house and kill her telling her about Hitler and finishing the job. You know, Maganam means nation's shield, and I like to say we're like a shield. We're about 30-30-30, where one-third is hired professionals dealing with institutional security, one-third dealing with community training, and then one-third is the, you know, working with government law enforcement. Uh, we're able to cover a lot of ground and cover a lot of incidents that police may not necessarily be able to respond to in time. A guy just getting out of prison punched a kid in the face, like an 11-year-old kid, obviously Jewish. We were able to get there within seconds, put the guy under a private, private person's arrest. That's what it's all about. Going through the NRA instructor program has, has allowed us to, you know, get the insurance, rent, rent the ranges, do the instruction, which ultimately helps us to protect our communities better. Going in, I felt kind of um, powerless, I felt kind of scared. And at the end of the session, I feel empowered, I feel stronger, and I feel I can better defend my family and myself. It was fun. <laughs> it was a great experience, it really was. Thank you, Rabbi Yossi, for providing this format. We're ready to protect ourselves and do what needs to be done. Thank you, Rabbi Yossi and Maganam. So guys, that's what it's all about. But let's take a moment to thank all of you. Recognize yourself, because you're here today, you're defending freedom, you're with the NRA, and we will never let Joe Biden take our guns. So thank you for all you do, and enjoy NRA Life member President Donald Trump in a couple minutes.
All right, let's hear it one more time for Billy and those compelling testimonials. Thanks, Billy. All right, I hope you guys are liking the program so far. It'll just be a little bit before that special guest takes the stage, but only at the world's largest outdoor show hosted by the NRA do you have a chance to see the president and potentially win a free firearm suppressor or some guns. I mean, who wants a free suppressor or some guns? All right, we want to thank our very generous donors of Stoger, Mossberg, Carr, and Keltec for their donations. You'll see members of our NRA staff walking around right now, throwing t-shirts out into the crowd. Here's a little fun secret. Inside some of those t-shirts are a certificate for a free firearm. So let's thank our sponsors, including our suppressor sponsor, Silencer Central. Look for the guys with the orange bag. Right, who wants them? Looks like this. Just bear with us for a little bit. Our special guest will be out soon. Oh, but the fire went wild. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, burns, burns. The ring of fire, the ring of fire. I fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, 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 and the flames went higher. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire. And it burns, 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 the ring of fire, the ring of fire, the ring of fire.
In the land of cotton, old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Oh, I wish I was in Dixie.
Deuteronomy, just before dawn, through a silence you feel you could cut with a knife, announces the cat who can now be reborn and come back to a different, jellical life.
good times for a change See the luck I've had can make a good man turn bad So please, please, please Let me, let me, let me Let me get what I want this time Haven't had a dream in a long time See the life I've had can make a good man bad So for once in my life let me get what I want Lord knows it would be the first time Lord knows it would be the first time
be lights burning brighter somewhere got to be birds flying higher in a sky more blue if I can dream of a better land where all my brothers walk hand in hand tell me why oh why oh why can't my dream Standing sometime, strong winds of promise that will blow away the doubt and fear. If I can dream of a warmer sun where hope keeps shining.
seven lonely days and a dozen times ago I reached out one night and you were gone Don't know why you'd run what you're running to or from All I know is I want to bring you home So I'm walking in the rain thumbing for a ride on this lonely Kentucky back road I've loved you much too long My love's too strong to let you go Never knowing what went wrong Kentucky rain keeps pouring down And up ahead's another town that I'll go walking through With the rain in my shoes To some old gray bearded men Sitting on a bench outside a general store They said yes, she's been here But their memory wasn't clear Was it yesterday? No wait, the day before Finally got a ride With a preacher man who asked Were you bound on such a cold dark afternoon? As we drove on through the rain, as he listened, I explained, and he left me with a prayer that I find in you. Kentucky rain keeps pouring down, and up ahead's another town that I'll go walking through with the rain in my shoes. Searching for you We hear you, we hear you. But right now, everybody, he can hear you too. So we're getting very, very close. But first, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you the 68th president of the National Rifle Association, Mr. Charles Cotton. Good evening, folks. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time in New York looking at folks who are not really happy to be in the courthouse, so it's nice to be able to address some, some people who are glad to be where they are. <clears throat> when I was first asked if I would introduce President Trump, I said, well, of course I will. And then it hit me, what exactly can I possibly say about a man who everyone here knows, every bit as well as I do. So, you know, I thought probably, probably the best thing I can do is tell a short story. Now, I've met President Trump a couple of three times, I don't know, maybe four. I've shaken his hands and exchanged pleasantries, but I don't know the man personally. And here's a story that I think just exemplifies who Donald Trump really is. In 2016, at the annual convention, 
Donald Trump spoke, he came on stage and he whispered to Wayne LaPierre, I'll never let you folks down. And that, that statement really rang a bell with me because although I don't know Donald Trump personally, I do know people who have done business with him. And to a person, the comment was, if Donald Trump ever gives you his word, he will never go back on it. <laughs> so that's why his statement to Wayne gave me a great deal of hope, because I kind of figured I knew how November 2016 was going to come out. And in keeping with what I've been told about him and what we all know now, we are so much better off from having Donald Trump as our president. On, on our issue, and that's what I'm going to stick to tonight, on our issue of the Second Amendment, we have the New York State Rifle Association versus Bruin case, the absolutely the most important Second Amendment case in over a decade. We got that decision, which it, in, in its, I guess the shortest form I'll call it, guarantees that the right to bear arms for self-defense or any other reason does not stop at your front door. Make no mistake about it. We have that decision and the freedom that comes with it solely because Donald Trump was our president and because he nominated three Supreme Court justices that actually believe the Constitution means what it says. The Second Amendment, indeed the entire Constitution, along with all Americans, have no greater friend than Donald Trump. Andrew, would you please join me at the podium here and help me welcome Donald Trump, the 45th President of the United States. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, and New York to LA, where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say,
Well, thank you very much, Charles and Andrew. That was beautiful, and we appreciate it. I'm thrilled to be back with the hardworking, God-fearing, true American patriots of the NRA right from the beginning. For four incredible years, it was my honor to be the best friend gun owners have ever had in the White House by far. Now I stand before you with a very simple promise. Your Second Amendment will always be safe with me as your President. When I'm back in the Oval Office, no one will lay a finger on your firearms. It's not going to happen. And I want to thank some of the great members of Congress that are with us today. We appreciate it. Scott Perry, brave man. Where is Scott? Where is Scott? He's fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Great job. Guy Reschenthaler. Guy Reschenthaler. Where is Guy? He's here. I just saw There he is. Thank you, Guy. Fantastic job. A good friend of mine, Dan Muser. Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, very much. He's great patriots, great people. Lloyd Schmucker. Thank you, Lloyd. Thanks very much. Great job, too. These are very brave people. Also, Ambassador Carla Sands, who's done a fantastic job. And a friend of mine, you wouldn't believe it, I met him when he worked at CNN. Can you believe it? No, no. He got out. He said, I'm out of here. He said, I'm out of here. And he's an incredible writer, a great intellect. Jeffrey Lord, wherever you may be. Jeffrey, thank you. As many of you know, last night we had a monumental victory in Nevada. It was a big one. We won over 99 percent of the vote and got more votes than any candidate in the history of the Nevada caucus. Think of that. That's a nice one. And we also won yesterday a beautiful place, I will tell you, but this is a beautiful place also. But we won the Virgin Islands, got 100 percent. We won it in a landslide. And three weeks ago, we all watched that. It was 40 degrees below zero. How about that? That's good. You don't have weather like that. We have some lousy weather here, too, but we don't have weather like that, 40 degrees. You couldn't walk from the car to a door, which was like there. And you walked and you said, I think I'm frozen. It was seriously cold. Three weeks ago, record-breaking margins. And we won, as you know, New Hampshire. We won Iowa. We won everything. In fact, when we went to Iowa, we won by the largest margin in the history of the Iowa caucus times two, double the largest margin. Then we went to New Hampshire, and we had more votes than any candidate has ever gotten in the history of the New Hampshire primary. So these are good signs. These are good signs. And 15 days from now, we're going to win the South Carolina primary. We're way ahead. But we only have a 42-point lead. That's not — that's not bad. And this November, we're going to win — remember, this is the big one — the White House, we're going to win the White House. <laughs> Starting with a historic trial right here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We love Pennsylvania. I went to school in Pennsylvania. I went to school in Pennsylvania. I love Pennsylvania. We ran twice. We won Pennsylvania twice. We won it twice. We did much better the second time than we did the first time. It's interesting, isn't it? Four years ago, I told you what would happen if Joe Biden got into office. I said he would throw open our borders, destroy our middle class, crush American energy. We were energy independent three years ago. Now we're asking Venezuela, can we have some of your oil, please? He was going to empower America's enemies, unleash 
misery throughout your state and throughout our country, bedlam and chaos at home and abroad. The only thing I didn't know is I didn't know how bad it would be. It's even worse. Everyone said I was exaggerating, but sadly, as the now famous saying goes, Trump was right about everything. I was right about Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the worst and most incompetent and most corrupt president in the history of our country. And today, I issue another warning. If Crooked Joe gets four more years, his second term will make his first term look like paradise. We're not going to have a country left anymore. We're not going to let it happen. We can never, ever let that happen. The stampede of illegal aliens across our borders will surge into the tens of millions. I hate to tell you, we're already there. I believe that you'll have 19 million people have come into our country illegally by the end of his term. 19, it's bigger than New York State. And the people that will benefit the least, the biggest losers in this whole invasion, will be African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, and all unions. Unions will be out of business. I met with the Teamsters the other day, had a good meeting with the Teamsters, and I said, you better get me because we're going to stop. We're going to close up our borders. We had the safest borders in the history of our country, and now we have the worst. Hourly wages will be cut in half if Biden's policies are allowed to continue. Open border, he wants open border. Nobody thought they were — nobody thought they were real when they say open border. They come in from prisons all over the world, from mental institutions all over the world. They're terrorists. What we're taking into our country — by the millions. And we're going to end it on day one. We end it on day one. Our cities have already become hell holes with carjackings, lootings, muggings, and murder. Spilling deep into the suburbs the other day, one of the great, great people who worked for me in the White House, an executive, brilliant young person, was carjacked and shot in the head and killed. And this is in Washington, D.C. It took place. He was picking up his wife, an incredible couple, beautiful couple, with children, beautiful children. And a thug came up put a gun to his head and killed him for no reason whatsoever, just killed him. Our currency will be trashed. Our middle class will be thrown into servitude and poverty. This is what's happening already. You see it's happening. You take a look at your cities. Your cities are going to hell. You take a look at what's going on. They're filthy, dirty. They're crime-ridden. People walk down the street. They get shot. They get mugged. We're really likely to face a, uh, I say, a hundred percent chance of a terrorist attack. You know, in 2019, and I didn't even believe this number, but the fake news, that's a lot of fake news. Look at that. That's a lot of fake news. I didn't believe this number, but they had up that in 2019, that's my time, there were no terrorists. You know, we had all sorts of bans. We had it down. We really had it down. Not one terrorist that they have, at least on record — sure, it can't be exactly correct — but not one terrorist was reported. Now, if you look at your numbers, more than we've ever taken are pouring into our country from all over the world, from countries that many of you have never even heard of. They're pouring into our country. And an entire generation of young people could very well be decimated by something that could very well happen, World War III, and it'll never happen with me. I can tell you that. It will never happen with me. Never. If you care about your country, if you care about your children, then this November you have to fire — remember The Apprentice? You're fired. You're fired. 
Some people say that's how I became president. I don't know if that's true or not. That was quite something. But you have to fire crooked Joe Biden, and we have to do votes like you've never seen before. They cheat like hell. We have to, we have to just swamp them. We're going to swamp them. They're not going to be able to cheat their way out of it. No, think of it. Who can get elected with high interest rates, open borders, food that costs 40, 50, 60 percent more than it did just a few years ago? Your lifestyles have changed. Who can get elected with this stuff? A woke military. We have a great military. I rebuilt the entire military. And how about Afghanistan, the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country? Which is why Putin probably looked at that. He saw incompetence all over. That was a surrender, I guess. And we had it not in 18 months. We didn't have one person shot or killed in Afghanistan. Not one person. And then this guy comes in, and he takes the soldiers out first, okay? A child. I could take that beautiful child in the third row. I see a beautiful child, like probably 10 or 11, say, would you move the soldiers out first or last? And he'd look at me and say, I think we'll do it last. They took the soldiers out, and then uh, you're supposed to take them out last. You take all the equipment, you take all the people, we had 13 incredible soldiers. I've gotten to know their families killed. These are unbelievable young people. The families are unbelievable, actually. They've come over to Bedminster in different places, and we love them. But 13 killed so unnecessarily. We had — we left behind $85 billion worth of equipment. You know, Afghanistan now is one of the largest sellers of military equipment in the world. They're selling our beautiful, brand-new equipment. We left hundreds of people behind, including others that we could have taken, but we left hundreds of Americans behind. They're still there. And I think when Putin and President Xi of China, when they look at this, all of a sudden, President Xi starts thinking in terms of Taiwan. He's certainly thinking a lot about it. They weren't thinking about it four years ago. And Putin was always the apple of his eye, but he would have never done it. He would have never done it. And he went into he went into a place that's so beautiful, and it's not so beautiful anymore. He went into Ukraine, and uh, what's happened there is very horrible, very, very horrible, very sad. These are things would have never happened. The attack on Israel would have never happened, would have never happened. And inflation would have never happened. We have inflation, the worst we've had in 72 years. Inflation would have never happened. Energy caused inflation. We had energy low. He had energy high because of his stupid policies. Perhaps worst of all, even as they turn America into a crime-ridden, gang-infested, terror-filled dumping ground, Joe Biden and his thugs will do everything in their power to confiscate your guns and annihilate your God-given right to self-defense. You have a right to self-defense. You've always had that right. And during — During my four years, nothing happened. And there was great pressure on me having to do with guns. We did nothing. We didn't yield. And once you yield a little bit, that's just the beginning. That's the avalanche begins. Four more years of Joe Biden means four more years of anti-gun communists running the ATF. They're going to run it. They've already — they're running it now, just in case you have any questions. But it means hundreds of more radical left judges waging a crusade against law-abiding gun owners. And four more years of Joe Biden means a nonstop war on gun makers, dealers, and sellers designed to put the entire industry right out of business. They want to put it out of business. I tell you, they've been — the NRA, for me, has been a great partner. They endorsed me early in 2016, and the relationship's been a great relationship. And I don't know what they're doing in May, but I understand they're having a very big event in May. They better endorse me. That's the only thing I could say. That's actually an endorsement that means something. Well, I'm coming to Dallas in May, I can tell you that. The only thing standing between you and the obliteration of your under siege Second Amendment is me. I'm the only thing. Anybody else? 
you wouldn't have your guns right now. You know, they started with the ammunition, you know that. They couldn't do the guns with me, so then they started getting rid of the ammunition. People said, I have a gun, I can't get ammunition. We took care of that very quickly. If Joe Biden is reelected, your gun rights will be gone. They'll be totally gone. You know, the, the sad part of that is uh, the bad guys aren't giving up their guns. The bad guys aren't. But the good people aren't giving up their guns either, because there's never going to be anybody that's going to be asking for your gun. And when I'm reelected, every single Biden attack on gun owners and manufacturers will be terminated my very first week back in office, perhaps my first day. And every pledge, and your officers will tell you this, every pledge I made to you as a candidate, I fulfilled as your president, every single pledge. Just as I promised back in 2016, I appointed nearly 300 pro-Constitution judges to interpret the law as written. I faced down vile attacks from the radical left to confirm three great Supreme Court justices. They're great justices. And standing before you at the NRA Leadership Forum in 2019, I revoked America's signature from the globalist United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, where basically they take your guns. Sir, they said, you can't do that, sir. All countries are signing that. Well, number one, all countries didn't sign, and most of the countries that signed didn't adhere to it anyway, but we would have. I said, no, we're not doing it. Even the NRA officers were surprised at that one. I stood up for our hunters, fishers, and sportsmen like no one has ever done before, opening up millions and millions of acres of federal land and rolling back Obama's assault on hunting, fishing, trapping, and ammunition. Obama was brutal. Obama was brutal. Biden happened to be along for the ride. I think maybe that's still happening, isn't it, huh? You know, whenever I say, you're President Barack Hussein Obama, they say, oh, he doesn't know who the president is. No, no, no. It's bad to be sarcastic with this group. When I do an imitation of him not being able to find the stairs, see how many stairs? We've got about five of them. I do an imitation, I go home, my wife said, darling, our great first lady, by the way, we have a great first lady. But I do an invitation, and I go home. She says, darling, you couldn't find the stairway out? No, it was an invitation. The fake news makes it sound like I couldn't find my way off the stage. When I mention certain names, they do. They are the worst. They are the worst. But hopefully, someday, they'll learn. You know, to make our country great, we have to have a fair and free press. It's very important. We need that. We need fair and free elections, and we need strong borders. We have to have strong, and we're going to have all of them. We had them just a little while ago, three years ago, like nobody's ever had them before. When the radical left Democrats tried to use COVID to shut down gun sales during the China virus pandemic, I proudly designated gun and ammunition dealers as critical infrastructure. Did you know I did that? Does anybody know I did that? Do you know the heat? Do you know the heat I took? Does anybody know the heat? I said gun dealers are critical infrastructure. That's an interesting one. But it worked. We kept those places open. I think maybe more than anybody in the world, gun dealers, they do like Donald Trump. They're in, they're in business. No, they want to shut them down. They used COVID. They tried to use COVID to shut them down. My administration also petitioned the Supreme Court to overturn New York City's unconstitutional ban on transporting handguns outside of the home. You have people walking on the streets with handguns that want to do bad things, and you had to keep your handgun at home. And to people that don't understand the industry and the gun world, they might think that sounds tough. It's not tough. It's really a survival. It's really is a, we have 700 million guns out there, and not all of them are had by very innocent people. 
And in a landmark case two years ago, the court affirmed that the right to self-defense does not end when you step outside the front door of your house. That was all things that we got together. But under crooked Joe Biden, your Second Amendment is again under siege. You know that. Biden has implemented a vicious zero-tolerance policy. Do you know what that is? It's not good. That revokes the license of independent firearms dealers if they make a single minor error, little tiny error, they're out of business. He imposed the so-called pistol brace rule, which orders law-abiding citizens to register or surrender guns with certain equipment. You know that. Many of you are forced to do it. I don't know. Is everybody doing it as per their demand? <laughs> Who in this group has done it? There's a hand way back there. By the way, this is a hell of a big building and it's packed. This is a big building. This is a big... This place is packed. A lot of people outside, too, trying to get in. Arena, big arena. And now Biden is trying to ban all private gun transfers in the United States with the stroke of a pen. Let's ban them all. Under a Trump administration, all of those Biden disasters get ripped up and torn out. My first week, but maybe my first day in office, okay? Maybe my first. You know, on Inauguration Day, did you ever see you have the beautiful stairs of the Capitol behind you? You're speaking in front of thousands and thousands of people, millions of people watching. But on the way out, you walk up a massive, like this, a massive flight of stairs. And I'm thinking about, you know, I said a few times, I said, I'm going to do my first thing in the Oval Office. Well, the Oval Office is sort of far away. You have to walk up the stairs, and then you have to walk quite a distance, and then you have to go downstairs, around corners. It takes you a long time. I'm thinking about doing this. If we win, a lot of people say when. No, you can never say when. You know what? You always have to say if. We have to work hard to win. I don't like to, I don't like to jinx anything. I say, if we win, we got to win. You got to win. But if we win, but or we could maybe make a minor change. We'll call it if and when. If and when, we win. I'm thinking about putting a desk somewhere on those stairs up. I'm going to have a desk. And I'm going to have a lot of papers on those desks, and a lot of them are going to have to do with you and what you love and what you respect. And we're going to knock out everything maybe before I get to the Oval Office. That'll look strange, won't it? We finish a nice speech to this incredible crowd, goes all the way down to the Washington Monument. We had some some crowd, I'll tell you. But it goes all the way down, and I'll be speaking, they'll say, that's strange. There's a desk about 12 stairs up. You got probably 100. What is that desk doing there? And it might look strange, but it's not going to be strange when I start signing those things. But we're going to knock it out. We're going to knock it out fast. And it is true, when the NRA endorsed me, you know, I said I was going to do it, but I was in the real estate business, and I was in business generally. We did great. But when I said it, a lot of people didn't really believe the things I was able to do for the gun owners and for a lot of other, a lot of other people, too, outside of the gun world. But we did every single thing and more, and it was my honor to do it. Incredible people. Incredible people. On day one, we will sack the radical gun grabber, Steve Dettelback. Did you ever hear of Steve Dettelback? Do you know who the hell he is? He, and we're going to replace him with an ATF director who respects the sacred right to keep and bear arms. You don't know who Dettelback is. He's a guy that is not good for this room. He's not good for you. We will fire ultra-left Interior Secretary Deb Holland and appoint a secretary who truly loves our hunters, fishermen, sportsmen, and outdoorsmen, like my sons. My sons love Don and Eric. They're, they're great hunters. They love the outdoors. 
They love it to a point, like I say, when are they coming back? And they're good, too. They're good. If they were golfers, they'd, they'd be better than scratch. Does anyone know what I mean when I say that? They'd be better. They're, they're really good. They can shoot. They can shoot as well as about anybody. But they love it. It's a great passion, and it's good for them. And we will completely overhaul the corrupt Department of Injustice to clear out all the communists who have weaponized government activities and gone against conservatives and gun owners, and we will replace them with relentless crime fighters on a mission to put dangerous criminals behind bars. If you're a violent criminal today, if you kill people, if you slaughter people, if you mug people, nothing happens. But if you're a religious person of a certain faith, you get persecuted. And I don't know what's going on with Catholics, but Catholics are being treated very badly. I don't know if you know that, but they're being treated very, very badly. What the hell is going on with Catholics? And yet, we got 88% of the evangelical vote, but we only got 50% of the Catholic vote. We should get 110% of the Catholic vote, what they're doing to Catholics. But we have a sick and corrupt, two-tiered system of justice in our country. Do I know better than anybody? As an example, it was just announced that Joe Biden, his Department of Injustice, will bring zero charges against Crooked Joe, despite the fact that he willfully retained, willfully retained and disclosed throws of ultra-classified national security documents. Now, that's not what I've been hearing, and he's not under the Presidential Records Act, which is a big thing. I am. It's a protective act. They're trying desperately to spin the Biden document disaster into a, oh, but wasn't Trump worse? No, 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 Trump was peanuts by comparison. That was 50 years, and he did a lot of it when he was at a very young age. He was mentally a little better than he is right now. But no, in actuality, I am covered by the very important Presidential Records Act, and therefore, I did absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. But Biden wasn't president. Only the president is covered. It's a big deal. And he wasn't covered. Also, Biden took documents over this long-term period as a senator, and as a vice president, well, that you're not allowed to do. Much of this period, he was at a very strong state, and he was fine. He was probably, in terms of the intelligence of senators, he was probably, out of 100, he was probably in the 95 category. I'd say he was 95th on the list. He was never setting any records. He made recovery almost impossible. Recovery of documents. He made it almost impossible for the federal government to get them. In fact, he gave classified material to the writer of his book in total violation of just about everything. I cooperated with the very unfriendly and hostile feds. I cooperated far more than Biden did, who sent records to Chinatown and shipped them all over the place. He shipped them to Chinatown and all over the place. They don't, told, they don't tell you about that. He was even at Penn Biden Center. Do you know that he gets paid millions of dollars? Do you know that? You know who pays him? China. China. You have the Penn Center, right? Penn Biden Center. He gets paid millions of dollars. And they pay, like, close to $100 million to the school itself. And by the way, I went there. I went to a place called the Wharton School of Finance. And so I know all about Penn. I love Penn, but Penn is getting a little bit out there. And they were also sitting underneath his beautiful Corvette that he talks so much about in a very flimsy garage with one of those very cheap garage doors. You know, you can cut it open with a scissor. Does anybody have a scissor? I want to get some classified documents. Let's cut it open. It had no security. No Secret Service, no nothing. And certain members of the Biden family lived there. I wonder what they did with those very important documents. But they had no Secret Service people there because he wasn't president. And Mar-a-Lago's loaded with secret. We have more Secret Service. 
But Biden fought them all the way. I didn't. They're trying to make it the other way. No, Biden fought them very hard, and they never got what they wanted to get anyway. I even gave the DOJ and the FBI lunch at Mar-a-Lago. You know, they say, I didn't behave. I gave them lunch. I said, have lunch at beautiful Mar-a-Lago, where they asked us to, do you mind, sir, doubling up the locks on the doors? Yeah, I'll double them up. We had locked doors. I'll double them up. And I did that. The discussions were good, and then they ended up with the now famous raid on Mar-a-Lago. We're having a talk, and they raided my house. They did it for publicity reasons. They did it for election interference reasons. They want to interfere with the election. So I guess they expected dinner, not lunch. I should have given them dinner, not lunch, I meant. If Biden is not going to be charged, he said, that's up to them. You know, look, if he's not going to be charged, that's up to them. But then I should not be charged. This is nothing more than selective persecution of Biden's political opponent, me. And I don't know that it's Biden, because I don't think he knows he's alive. But it's, it's vicious and very smart people that surround the Resolute Desk. You know what the Resolute Desk is? The most beautiful desk. You know, when you're president, they allow you to pick your desk. There are things that are very nice, they're very nice. And they have these unbelievable desks. One of them is the Resolute Desk. That's the one I took. And it had a tremendous history of presidents behind it. And uh, he has the same desk. I think he took it because he likes me so much, you know? He said, I want to use this. I want the same desk as President Trump had, but never has such a thing as what he's done with the weaponization of our government, DOJ, FBI. It's never taken place in our country. It only takes place in third world countries. This has never happened in our country before. And the local DAs are part of it, and the attorney generals are all a part of it. You saw what happened in Atlanta with Fani, F-A-N-I, Fani. How do you pronounce F-A-N-I, Fani? <laughs> they interviewed her a year before. I would never have an affair with anybody in my office. Well, she had an affair. <laughs> and they paid the guy almost a million dollars. The only way, and, it, and honestly, that just corrupts all of justice. And they spent a lot of time at the White House. You, you read that. It came out last week, right? Everybody read it? If you didn't read it, I'm telling you now, and I'm telling all the fake news back there. They spent a lot of time in the White House. And you know what they were talking about? How do we get Trump? How do we get him? He's been quite elusive over the years, hasn't he? He's been quite elusive. The only way to defeat this corrupt and weaponized system is to defeat crooked Joe Biden, to vote overwhelmingly for President Donald J. Trump in November, which is voting for yourselves under the Biden administration. Every facet of our government has been perverted, corrupted, and turned upside down and inside out. The Justice Department persecutes law-abiding gun owners and pro-life Christians while violent felons are released from jails by the thousands and thousands. A 95-year-old veteran was kicked out of a nursing home 95-year-old veteran, a highly regarded veteran, to make way for an illegal alien that came into our country. <laughs> gangs, the most vicious gangs you've ever seen. They make our gangs look like very nice people by comparison. Gangs from Venezuela, Honduras, and El Salvador are treated like victims, while Republicans are treated like criminals. We're treated like criminals, and a lot of other groups of people in this country. Rich people are given $7,000 subsidies to buy luxury electric cars. Think of it, electric cars. Is this the word? They don't go far. You know, somebody said, how do you describe it in a simple manner? I said, I have an idea. They don't go far. Doesn't sound very glamorous, but it happens to be true. You know, when I was in Iowa, I told you 40 degrees below zero. There were so many cars in the road. I said, boy, there are a lot of cars out here. No, these are cars because electric cars don't work in very cold weather. So I would say 40 degrees below zero is a fine test. 
And I came back with a result that they don't work in cold weather. It's right. But they do it using money stolen from middle-class families who cannot afford to buy a car for themselves. The whole electric car thing is crazy. It's crazy. Everybody should have the right to buy an electric car. But, you know, we have liquid gold under our feet more than any other country. We can have combustion. We can have combustion engines. We can have hybrids. Hybrids are actually pretty good, you know, the combination of both. But all electric, unless you're going to go very short distances, I wouldn't want to — I wouldn't want to go long. I wouldn't want to go long. And there — oh, we're going to drill, baby, drill. That's what we're going to do. We're going to drill, baby, drill. We'll drill, baby. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That was very nice. You guys have a good voice. No, we're going to drill, baby, drill. We're going to get our prices down. We had — we had gasoline at numbers that you hadn't seen in 25 years. We were selling — we were doing so incredible. We never had a country that was doing so well as it was during the Trump four years, which is why we're — which is why we're leading in the polls. We're leading everybody. We're leading — I think the Republican primary is essentially over. That's what I hear. We'll go to South Carolina. We're going to do great in South Carolina. We're actually going — we're actually going tomorrow to South Carolina. You know, I used to have a nice, simple life. I didn't have to go around and make speeches to massive stadiums. And if you say one word, a little bit mispronunciation, you end up front page, what's wrong with him? You make nine speeches. I have a guy I'm competing against who doesn't — he hasn't spoken in months. And when he does, it's not pretty, is it? Not pretty. Not pretty. And I got to know — President Xi of China and Putin of Russia got to know a lot of the leaders. They're, they're tough cookies and smart. And uh, I just can't imagine what happens when they close the doors and go into a little negotiation. Unfortunately, I, I know what happens, and it's not good for America. It's not good. A vote for Biden is a vote for all of this communist lunacy that you're seeing around you with the open borders and all of the problems that are caused. A vote for Trump is really a vote for common sense. You know, we're conservative and all of that. But I say, more than anything else, it's common sense. We want borders. We want strong borders. We want great education. We want low taxes. We want a powerful military, but not necessarily to use it every week on going after countries that don't want anything to do with you. The day I'm inaugurated is the day that law and order, sanity, and justice will return back to the United States of America. On day one, we will seal the border and stop the invasion of America. We're being invaded just like it's a military invasion. There's no different. You know, we are — we are losing, in my opinion, 300, 350,000 people a year to fentanyl. There's no war, for the most part, where you're going to lose that many soldiers, where you're going to lose that many people. We're losing 350,000, I believe. They always say it's 100, 125. It's not. It's much more. It's getting worse, too. We had a very strong border. It was very hard for them to get things through our border. And now they just walk through. Nobody checks. We spent a lot of money on equipment. I said, get me the best equipment. But do you know the best thing for detecting drugs? is a certain type of German Shepherd. Do you know that? They are unbelievable. There's no machine that costs $2 million each that can even come close. So I love those dogs. I think they're great. They, 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 you can't get away with it. I mean, they put them in their cylinders of a gas car. They don't have cylinders in the electric cars too much. But they put them in hubcaps. They put them in places. I always say, you know, I've seen the way they bring them in. If they would devote that genius to making money legitimately, they'd be very wealthy people. But what they do is incredible. But the best thing you have is a certain type of German Shepherd. It's unbelievable. They go right up to it. They say, that's it. They point to it. You take off the hubcap and stuff pours out. You say, hey. But, you know, we worked hard on it, and we had it way down. And now it's coming in at a level of 10 times more what it was four years ago, 10 times more. Many people are dying. Fentanyl 
And I had to deal with President Xi that he was going to give the maximum penalty for sending fentanyl to the United States. I had that deal because he understood tariffs. I charged him massive hundreds of millions of dollars China paid to the United States. Not one president ever, not one president got 10 cents for China. They're great negotiators. You know, they'd say, but we are a developing nation. Well, so are we. Have you seen our cities? Our cities, you might as well redevelop. And we're going to do that, by the way. We're going to redevelop our cities in this country. And we're going to redevelop and fix our capital, which is a murder den. People are getting murdered every single week. Many people, in some cases. We're going to bring back our capital. We're going to bring back law and order. We're going to have the federal government run it. And we're going to bring back the capital, Washington, D.C. We're going to put it in the safe fold. We're going to have it safe. We're going to have it clean. We're going to take the graffiti off the marble columns, those beautiful, beautiful mar marble columns put up a hundred years ago and more. These gorgeous Carrera columns. I know all about the marbles. I can tell you every marble. But these beautiful columns that are Incredible how they could have done it years ago without the powerful tractors that you have today and lifters and cranes. They got them up and they're beautiful and they have graffiti on them. We're not going to have any more graffiti and we're not going to have roads that are in bad shape. We're not going to have medians that are falling down. We're not going to have paper that's been down for six, six months. I mean, you look at some of this, you look at the damage, the destruction, the filth. And you have cars, and I wonder what these leaders say as they're driving into Washington, D.C., and there's paper all over the roads and beer cans and everything all over the roads, strewn all over the place, and the medians are falling down. You know, that metal median that they use so much? Real garbage. I mean, you put it up, and I think the sun makes it warp. You ever see this stuff? You put it up two weeks later, the thing looks like it's been up there for 30 years. What crap. Somebody made a lot of money doing that. Whoever the man that sells that stuff is, I want to hire him immediately, because I think he's the greatest salesman on earth. They're all laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Right? A little ching, ding, ding. This, it's like you put it down. The next day, it's like this. I, you have to understand, that was my business. I was really good at that business. It's called construction. Three years ago, we had the most secure border in the history of our country. We ended catch and release. We built 561 miles of border wall. We got Mexico to send 28,000 soldiers to our border, free of charge. Everyone said, you didn't get them free. I said, I got them free. By the way, I used to say, Mexico's going to pay for a big piece of the wall. Mexico paid much more than that. They gave us free soldiers, free military. They did things for us because that I could do. You're not allowed to do that. They can't pay for our wall no mechanism, but there was a mechanism where they could give us soldiers, 28,000 soldiers. And you know, it was very interesting. Uh, some of you have heard the story, but I went to Mexico. One, a woman in the State Department was terrific, but she was a lousy negotiator, actually, but a terrific woman. She dealt with Mexico for 25 years. And she said, sir, you're not going to be able to get this stuff. I went to Tom Homan. I went to Brandon Judd, the Border Patrol. I went to these great, I said, what are your top, give me a top 10 list. And they gave me a top 10 list. No more catch and release. No more, a lot of things. We want the war, we want the this, we want that. We wanted a lot of different things. And the woman looked at me, she said, sir, we've been after that for 25 years, as long as I can, you'll never get it. I said, yes, we will, 100%. Sir, you won't be able to get it. And I like the president of Mexico, the s uh, former president, I guess, he's going to be taken off for somebody else has taken his place. I'm sure I like the person that's taken his place. We'll get along just fine, but I like. So what happened is I said, no, no, they're going to have to give us 28,000 soldiers. That's a lot of money. I also want a thing called remain in Mexico. Isn't that a good idea? Remain. Remain in Mexico. You know, Biden ended that. When he ended remain in Mexico, and I built all of these hundreds of miles of wall, in three weeks, we could have thrown up another 200 miles of wall. Three weeks. And that's when I realized they want open borders because they didn't want it. And they took the wall, which was exactly what the Border Patrol, it wasn't my design, it was a design by Border Patrol. I frankly would have liked concrete plank going straight up, but you had to be able to see through. A lot of different things. They wanted it to be steel, concrete, and rebar. 
I built everything, even the paddle on top. I hate the way it looks, but it's called an anti-climb paddle. It makes it almost impossible, unless you're a Mount Everest climber, to get over the wall. These guys would scoot over the wall like it was nothing. But that's an anti-climb paddle. We did everything they wanted, and we built it. And it was so much more than I promised to build. And then I said, we need more, because people would go out on these sketches, and we had to fill in the certain areas that were hard to get legally from eminent domain and various other things. So what happened is we're building the wall, a lot of people coming in, a lot of death, a lot of destruction, a lot of people pouring in, but peanuts compared to what it is. This is peanuts. And I got Mexico. I said, you're going to have to pay for the soldiers free of charge. They, they laughed at me. They said, we're not doing that. I said, you have to. I'm sorry. We're not doing it, sir. You have to be. Here's a guy, handsome guy, beautiful representative. He laughed. He said, <laughs> sir, we're not giving you soldiers. Why the hell would we give you soldiers? He actually thinking to himself, we've been ripping off the United States for years. Why the hell would we give them soldiers to protect their border? We're not doing that. We want them out of Mexico, these people that are coming up. A lot of criminals, a lot of bad people are coming through. So I said, no, no, you're giving it to us, 100 percent. No, 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 sir, I'm not giving it to you. I said, listen, 100 percent that you're giving it to me. We're not giving it to you, sir. You're giving it to us. He goes, no way. I go, way. And that, so we left it. And I said, here's a story. You're going to give us every one of these items. I have 10 items. And remain in Mexico is a big one. But no more catch and release. We call it catch and release in Mexico. We had catch and release in the United States. We catch a criminal. And we release the criminal in the United States. What the hell? And then we say, come back in six years for a court case. Only the really dumb ones came back. Most of them just, that was it. They were in our country. We had them. But some really dumb ones came back. I'm here to uh, go through a court case. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. So what happened is I said, no, you're going to give it to us. So he said, why are you so confident that I'm going to give it to you? I said, here's why. Because I have before me a document, and I'm signing it now. And if you don't give us 28,000 soldiers immediately to protect our border from people pouring into our country, I am going to charge you a 25 percent tariff on every single thing you make, including all of the cars because you stole, you know, they stole 32 percent of our car industry, by the way, in case you don't know. And every car made in Mexico that gets sold in the United States is going to have a 25 percent tariff. And if it doesn't take place within a month, it's going to go to 50 percent and then 75 percent. And he said, uh, sir, may I please take five minutes and call my president? I said, you may. He comes back. Comes back. Sir, it would be a great honor to supply you with 28,000 soldiers. It would be my honor, sir. It would be my honor. And we had a great relationship with Mexico, and we had the safest border we've ever had in this country. Ever had. And then as the wall got built longer and longer, but we could have added another 200 miles, and they didn't want to do it. And then they ended up selling that expensive wall, very expensive. They sold it for five cents and 10 cents on the dollar for scrap. And that's when I said, these people really want open borders. It's not even believable. But we did a hell of a job, I'll tell you. And uh, we'll do it again. And we're going to do it again, bigger, better, stronger than ever before. It's all going to happen. It's all going to happen. And we have no choice. And if we don't get elected, we have no country any longer. I really believe that these people, they're crazy. These people, what they're doing to our country is insane. You have to see, some of the people coming into our country are, these are hardened criminals. These are hard, tough, they're prisoners. They make our prisoners look like very nice people, okay? These are hardened criminals that are coming into our country. And now you're seeing the problem. You saw where they beat the hell out of two police officers in New, York, in New York City. And then the DA said, let them go. That's OK. But he goes after Trump. He goes after Trump. You have to be a violent criminal. If you're a violent criminal, you have no problem. Under Biden, millions of illegals are now pouring into our country. And these include terrorists. You know, you have a 100 percent chance of a major terror attack in the not-too-distant future. What, it's a terrible thing to say. I went four years with no terror attack, four years. And I could never talk about it. 
We call it the band. Remember the travel band? We cleaned up the name a little bit. But we didn't take people from countries with the massive terrorism and the attacks. We don't want our shopping centers blown up. We don't want our people destroyed. We don't want dead children where a family will never be the same. We're never going to do We're not going to do that. And we did a job, but I never talked about it. I couldn't talk about it because I didn't want to say about how well we're doing on terrorism and then have a terrorism attack the next day. So I never got to talk about it. But the day I left, I started talking about what a great job we did. Thousands and thousands of people are coming in. And you notice they're all men. And they're all between 18 and 25 or 26 years old, practically all. Meaning like military. Think of it. Very few women. I don't want to disrespect you when I say few women, but that's the way it goes. Sometimes I got to tell it like it is. Not a lot of women. Men are coming into our country, at level, and a lot of them coming in. 29,000 from China over the last few months. 29,000. They're coming in from Yemen. You know, the bombing has already started. When I was uh, thinking about doing this, the Middle East was being bombed to hell. And I said, you know, it's not necessary. We could do it in a much better way. They have to respect your leaders. I looked yesterday, there's bombs going up all over the place. Everyone's fighting. It's a whole mess. We had uh, a great, great leader, Viktor Orban. You know who he is of Hungary? Viktor Orban, he said, there's only one way that this problem is going to be solved, because the whole world is blowing up. You look at Ukraine, you look at Israel, you look at the whole Middle East, you look at everything. China's talking about going into Taiwan. But Victor's a tough leader and a smart man and highly respected, but he's tough. And he was interviewed recently, and he said, there's only one way it gets solved. Trump has to become president of the United States again, because people <laughs> respected him. I knew exactly what he was talking about. When I'm president, instead of trying to send the state of Texas a restraining order, I will send them reinforcements. They're going to get reinforcements. They're doing a good job. And I'll use all necessary military and law enforcement resources to defend the United States of America. We're going to be very strong. And within moments of my inauguration, we will begin the largest deportation operation in American history. We have no choice. We have no choice. We have no choice. And we're going to start with the very bad ones, because the very bad ones are very, very bad. They're worse than anybody you've seen. And we know who. You know who knows who they are? Your police force. Your local police know exactly who they are. They know them by name. We have to respect our police. Our police have done a great job, and they have not been given the kind of respect that they deserve. But we're going to let our police do their job. Did you ever see, I mean, we have a phenomenon going on now where a department store, for years they wanted to go into a city, a location, and they finally got it built. They spent millions of dollars. And now this new phenomenon where hundreds of people rush into the store, mostly younger people, with masks and everything. They rush into the store, and they walk out with television sets. And I mean, I saw one the other day walking out with a refrigerator. He's got this massive. I said, he's a pretty strong guy, right? Can you believe? And the police are standing there, and they're not allowed. It's not that they don't do anything. They're not allowed. They say, you will not do anything to stop this. We can stop that problem. This is a new phenomenon. Nobody's ever seen it before where they send 300 kids into a department store, and within 15 minutes, the entire store is wiped out, millions and millions of dollars. Then they close the store, and the neighborhood becomes a blighted neighborhood. The whole thing, it's like a chain. It's a chain effect, and it's a horrible thing that's happening. There's no respect for our law enforcement, and our law enforcement could have respect very quickly. And you could stop that phenomena in one day, in one city, if you got tough. If you got tough, the whole country would see it, and it would stop immediately. Despite the worst border crisis in U.S. history, crooked Joe Biden just tried to ram through a massive open borders bill 
that would allow nearly 2 million illegals per year. Did you see that? 5,000 people a week. Some people said 5,000 people a day. But I think they meant 5,000 a week. We're allowed to come in, dispense unlimited numbers of work permits for illegal aliens to steal American jobs. The unions are going to be out of business. I'm telling you, if the Teamsters endorse Biden, here's the good news. Most of the Teamsters are going to vote for me anyway. But — and the unions. And workers, just workers. But you give illegal taxpayer-funded lawyers, so they have millions of dollars in this agreement, in this deal, which we, by the way, killed. I think we killed it. I think it's dead. But you can never say it, because bad bills always come back to life, because these guys make a lot of money with bad bills. But they give millions, tens of millions of dollars — it's down there — to lawyers to represent the illegal immigrants that come into our country. It's, it's not even believable, some of the things. You ever notice they come off? Everybody has a cell phone. They come in, they get off a bus. There's always some nice person greeting them. I don't know who these people are. They, hello, welcome. Do you ever notice that? They have, like, these people. Nice women, beautiful women. Hello, it's so nice to see you. The guy looks at her like he's going to rip her apart. Hello. He never saw this. He, nobody ever shook his hand before. Hello. Here's your cell phone. Here's your this. Here's your credit card. Would you like to stay today at the Waldorf Astoria, or would you like a Trump hotel? <laughs> no, it's crazy. It's crazy. Our soldiers are great veterans. I met some of the incredible parents of, of some fallen soldiers in the back. Incredible. They have the pictures on their on their chests, just beautiful, beautiful kids. We have veterans that are living like dogs on the streets, and we have illegal immigrants who are living in luxury hotels with cell phones and credit cards. And that's going to all change very fast. What's well, going to change because we're not allowing people into our country anymore unless you come in legally, so it's going to change in that way. In fact, one of the bill's top Democrat architects admitted just yesterday that illegal aliens are, quote, the people that we care most about. They care. The Democrats care most. He said, these are the people we care most about. Because you know why? They want those people to vote. Now, the good news is they cheat so much, they really don't need them. That's why I was never a believer. They cheat with ballots, and they drop ballots, and fake ballots, and a hundred different things. They got more ways of cheating. It's a way of life. It's become a way of life. Our elections are so rigged. But just in case, they're going to be voting. Those people are going to be voting. They try and get them registered. They don't speak a word of English. You're going to register here. Oh, oh, I see. But they have no idea what's going on. They want to get them to vote in our movement. We believe the highest priority should be law-abiding Americans, not illegal aliens. We got to take care of our soldiers. We have to take care of our veterans and our police and our firemen, people that have loved our country. I mean, you see it over the last few days. I don't know what it is. I've been saying, I wonder why it doesn't seem like, because the fake news doesn't want to report migrant. We call it migrant crime. It's unbelievable what's going on. And now, for the first time, you're seeing migrant crime. These are tough people. Again, many of them come out of jails and mental institutions. They're not just sitting there looking for a job, learning English and let me get a great job. These are tough people. These are hardened criminals in many cases. And now you're seeing migrant crime. When a policeman goes up to them, they laugh right in the policeman's face and then punch him in the face. These are not innocents. These are tough people. And we're taking them by the millions. We're taking millions of people, millions and millions. We have no idea who they are, where they come from. We're not doing it anymore. We're not doing it anymore. And the biggest fear I have, the biggest problem I have, 10 months is a long time. The damage that can be done to our country in 10 months, including World War III, including World War III, the way we're going, we're going to end up in World War III. We have a guy that can't put two sentences together, and he's in charge of negotiations with Russia, with China, with North Korea. It's a dangerous — we're in a very dangerous position. I, I believe we've never been in a more dangerous position in our lives. And if the Senate wants to pass a real border bill, 
they should establish criminal penalties for senior Biden officials who refuse to enforce the existing law. They don't want to do anything. You know, you don't need a bill. The president has the right to say, close the borders. The bill is a hoax. The Democrats are asking for this bill that's so ridiculous. It's a horrible bill. It's actually going to make it worse. But I keep saying, you don't need a bill. I did it. I had no bill. And you know what I did? We're having a hard time with some of our senators, our wonderful senators. I took it out of the military to build a wall because I called it an invasion. This is, an inv this is a military invasion. And I built the wall mostly with funds from our military. I said, I'm sorry. You know, you give the military $750 billion, you can take a little bit out to stop an invasion of our country. After seeing the recent video of a wild pack of illegal aliens viciously attacking these two New York City really good people, too, I saw an interview, high-quality police officers, I'm going to ask Congress to pass a strong sentencing enhancement bill that any illegal alien assaulting a police officer, they immediately go to jail, or even better, they get thrown out of the country, brought back to the country that came from, because putting them in jail is very expensive for us. It's very expensive. For the past three years, the radical left has been busy persecuting me, my family, Christians, patriots, and even the NRA. And meanwhile, the country is in chaos, and bloodthirsty criminals are running wild and roaming our streets. Crooked Joe Biden and the radical left Democrats, they don't care one bit about the terrible suffering of their people, the people in this country, the policies that they've caused all of this destruction and death. But I do care. I care a lot. Because I didn't need this. I had a very nice life. Nice Saturday afternoon. I could tell you, if I weren't doing this where I would have been, I would have been in a very nice location. But I didn't need this, but I'm so happy I did. A lot of people say, President, could I ask you, if you had it, because they see the way I'm being persecuted by these animals. They said, President, if you had it to do again, successful people ask me this question all the time, would you do it again? You know what I say? Absolutely. What we're doing is so important. We're not going to have a country left. We're going to make America great again. It's very simple. But they ask me that. They ask me a few questions. They ask me that one. Would you do it again? Always the answer is very quick. I don't even have to think about it. The answer is yes. We're going to make this country so great, better than it's ever been. It would have been easier if we just did the other four years. It was all set to go. But now we have to bring it back, because now it's gone. It's gone substantially down since this character took over, or whoever it is that's running it, because nobody really does. But when I'm back in the White House, remember, that's the one question they ask. The other question they ask is, will they do it again, sir? Will they do it again? In other words, they're going to cheat again. We're not going to let them cheat. We're not going to let them cheat. Whoever thought it was even possible. When I'm back in the White House, we will mount an all-out campaign to stop the scourge of violent crime in America. We're going to stop it. Upon my inauguration, I will direct a completely overhauled DOJ to investigate every radical, out-of-control prosecutor in America for their illegal, racist, and reverse enforcement of the law. Then we will smash the gangs, the street crews, and the criminal networks that are tearing up our country. They're tearing up our country. They have criminal networks that are like businesses. They're run better than most businesses, and they're run viciously and violently. It's not NRA members who are shooting up their communities, so instead of trying to eviscerate the rights of law-abiding gun owners, I will have federal law enforcement prosecute the countless gun crimes committed by gang members, drug dealers, and convicted felons. You know, when I went to China, I got to know President Xi of China, a very strong man, a very strong man. And he said, uh, it is so nice to meet you. I said, nice to meet you, too. We started talking about different things. I said, 
What about drugs in China? Do you have a drug problem? No, 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 we have no drug problem. Think of it, 1.4 billion people. No, 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 we have no drug problem. I say, so uh, how'd you pull that one off? Now, they used to have a massive with the poppy, the opium. I mean, there was a drugged out country like we're becoming. You know, we're becoming a drugged out country. I don't know if you know it or not. We have drugs at a level that's never been seen anywhere. You have to look at the statistics this year. We're becoming China at one time, many years ago, was a drugged out country. And weak countries were taking parts of China. Other countries were taking parts that would normally never be able to happen. But years ago, they instituted the death penalty for drug dealers. And as soon as they did that, it stopped. It stopped. So I said, you have a drug problem. No, no, no. He looked like, you know, like, what the hell kind of a stupid question is that do we have? Of course we don't have a drug problem. I said, what do you attribute to? Quick trial. I said, quick trial. What is a quick trial? If you're a drug dealer and if you get caught selling drugs, they give you an immediate trial, immediate. And then, sadly, you're executed. And so the drug dealers don't go there. They don't have a drug problem at all. They have a very meaningful death penalty. They don't have a drug deal at all. And uh, they don't have a problem, like, at all. 1.4 billion people. No, no problem. And frankly, you know, we organize all these committees. We did a good job. I had the first lady on committees. I had a lot of nice people. I had a lot of socialites from New York. We had a lot of socialites from Philadelphia. We, they all want to be on. And many of them just love the glamour of being on a committee, but they don't know about El Chapo. They don't know about the — they don't know about the toughness that you're talking about, the ruthlessness that you're talking about. And they do things, and they have a little discussion, and then start talking about when they're having dinner, where they're going. I wonder how nice it is, nice to be. They talk about restaurants. No. The only way you're solving that problem — and I don't know that our country is ready for it. Remember this. Every drug dealer kills a minimum of 500 people during his or her lifetime. When you think of that, maybe you think differently. I don't know that this country is ready for it, but until you have the death penalty for drug dealers, you're never going to solve the problem. You're just kidding yourself. You're just kidding yourself. But I don't know that it's ready. But I will know when it's ready, because it's getting really bad. It's gotten so bad over the last three years, we've never seen increases like this ever before. I'm also going to indemnify our great police officers and law enforcement officials throughout the United States to protect them from being destroyed by the radical left for taking strong action on crime. No, they get rough with some horrible criminal. They lose their job. They lose their pension. They lose their wife or a husband. They lose their family. They, they get destroyed because they're doing their job. We're going to indemnify them. They're told to go out and get your own lawyer. Can you imagine you're a policeman and you're, you're dealing with rough people in many cases? And they say, go get your own lawyer. We're not going to — we're not going to do anything. We're not going to spend the money. No. We're going to indemnify police officers that do their job. We're going to indemnify them and precincts and, in some cases, states, depending on who's running the state. We're going to work with Democrats. We're going to work with whoever. But we're — we are giving indemnification to the police for doing their job. They're not going to be sued and destroyed or fired and destroyed. We're not going to let that happen. And to further deter these barbaric criminals and help you defend yourself and your family, I will ask Congress to send a bill to my desk delivering national right to carry reciprocity. You're going to have that. And if you have a, a meaningful Second Amendment, which you have, it's under siege. They got nowhere with me, but they got a lot of, lot of things happening with Biden. It has to go across state lines. You have to be able to go across state lines with Second Amendment privileges. Just as I did before, I will appoint rock-solid conservative originalists to the federal bench, including the United States Supreme Court. Great new. Justices, 
almost 300 judges throughout the country. Big difference. I will stop the effort to deny banking and financial services to gun makers and dealers. They won't allow banks to deal with them. And I will never allow the creation of a central bank digital currency, which is a method of stealing your money. Very dangerous. And we will restore free speech in America. We will have free speech. We do not have it now. We will reverse the Biden ban on natural gas exports. We will end his war on American energy. And we will unleash Pennsylvania oil and natural gas at a level never seen before. On the world stage, we will restore peace through strength. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content onto our children. And I will keep men out of women's sports. How crazy. And we will secure our elections with one-day voting, voter ID. We are going to have paper ballots, and we are going to have great, secure elections. You would have no idea how big a difference that'll make. And in conclusion, this is the most important election in the history of our country. You know, I used to say in 2016, this is the most important, and I meant it. But you look at the border. We had a border problem in 2016. I fixed it so strong that it wasn't even talked about in 2020. I kept saying to my people, I want to talk about the border. What a great job I did. They said, sir, nobody cares about the border. You fixed it. I couldn't talk about it. And yet, we still got millions and millions more votes in 2020 than we did in 2020. We did much better in 2020. A lot of bad things happened. You know that. I'm not going to let that happen again. But we did much, much better. Millions and millions of more votes. We got the most votes in the history of our country for a sitting president. But now we're going to blow that number away. I've never seen ever such spirit. We had 2016, 2020. The level of spirit was incredible. This blows it away. Because basically, you've seen how incompetent these people that are destroying our country, what they're doing. So Pennsylvania is one of the most important battleground states in the nation. You know, when I won Pennsylvania in 2016, remember they said, no, Pennsylvania won't be able to be won. Everybody said that. Hadn't been won, I think, 36 years. And I won Pennsylvania. Again, did much better in Pennsylvania than we did in 2016, too. And I was just coming over, and some of the guys working here said, sir, you are more popular in this state right now. You're going to blow Pennsylvania away. That's what I think is going to happen. But if you live in this Commonwealth, register everyone you know and get them out to vote. We have to. We have to win in November, or we're not going to have Pennsylvania. They'll change the name. They're going to change the name of Pennsylvania. How about all over the country? They're taking the name of George Washington off high schools and other things. George Washington. That's one even I thought was safe. Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. Their names are now endangered. No, we are going to have to win. You're not going to have a country anymore. You're not going to have a state anymore. You're not going to have anything. We have to swamp them with so many votes that they can't rig it or they can't steal it. You know, at a certain level, they can't rig it anymore. It's too much. Pennsylvania is the commonwealth where our founding fathers declared American independence. Such an incredible state politically. It's where they designed and wrote our glorious Constitution. It's where Pennsylvania oil came out. The first well, do you know that, in the United States, Pennsylvania oil, and where strong Pennsylvania steel was poured into the backbone of our country. And now, U.S. steel was just sold to Japan. Okay, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? I wouldn't approve that deal. I wouldn't approve it. And this is the state where generations of tough, strong Pennsylvania workers, farmers, soldiers, and laborers forged the greatest nation in the history of the world. 
But now, we are a nation in decline. We are a failing nation. We don't like to say that. I don't like to say that. We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has lost its confidence, its willpower, and its strength. Think of that. We've lost our confidence as a nation. We are a nation that has lost its way. But we are not going to allow this horror to continue. Three years ago, we were a great nation, and we will soon be a great nation again. It was hardworking patriots like you who built this country, and it's hardworking patriots like you who are going to save our country. We will fight for America like no one has ever fought before. 2024 is our final battle. With you at my side, we will demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, fascists. We will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. We will protect our Second Amendment. We will evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House on November 5th, 2024. That's when it begins. The great silent majority is rising like never before. And under our leadership, the forgotten man and woman will be forgotten no longer. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you, everybody. God bless you all. Thank you, Pennsylvania. Thank you all. God bless you.
with the energy in this room tonight. I hope each and every one of you are back here tomorrow night for Warren Ziders and Randy Hauser. And if you're not an NRA member, you need to be an NRA member. NRA.org backslash join. Do it today. Be part of the NRA family. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a good night.